Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for a panel discussion hosted by the Conservation and Adaptation Resources Toolbox, or CART for short. Um, my name is Ariel, and I'm the Grassland Community Practice Coordinator, uh, and I sit at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Carly Jewell from Fish and Wildlife Service Applications is here with me today and will help me run this webinar. For those who are new to CART, CART supports issue-based instead of geography-based conservation by facilitating peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing through case studies, webinars, and workshops. These activities support the development of communities of practice focused on grassland restoration, the control of non-native aquatic species, aquatic restoration, and drought and climate adaptation. Today, we're lucky enough to be hearing from Tara Bishop and Scott Shumershu, followed by a panel discussion where these two presenters will be joined by other members of the Pinion J Working Group and Steve Cassidy from the Arizona Big Fish Department to answer questions from the audience as a panel and propose questions for discussion for the group uh, after the webinar presenters. We encourage everyone to write any questions directly into the chat as folks are presenting, and we'll keep track of these questions for the panelists after the presentations. Um, I'll introduce the speakers. Uh, so Tara, Tara joins us from the USGF Southwest, Southwest Biological Science Center in Moab, Utah, where she studies community and ecosystem ecology, how plant and soil communities respond to fire, climate change, land use, and invasive species. Today, Tara will present how her team is developing improved state and transition models that can help managers make more informed land management decisions in fire-prone pinion juniper ecosystems. These improved models use an ecological site framework that incorporates more robust fuels and fire data. The team is mapping current conditions in these ecological sites, determining attainable desired conditions, and assessing departure from desired conditions based on end user and scientific metrics. So Tara, feel free to start sharing your screen and I'll pass the mic to you. Okay, all right, and I've unmuted myself. So, uh, hello and thank you for being here to listen to my talk where, um, you know, as was introduced, I'll be discussing how we're researching ways to create generalized state and transition models for landscape management using the framework from ecological site groups. Again, my name is Tara Bishop and I work for the US Geological Survey, the Southwest Biological Science Center. So just a quick introduction about my team and I who are developing ecosystem models that are incorporating more in-depth fire and fuels information that will be able to be used as a tool uh, for landscape management on the Colorado Plateau. More specifically, we are first targeting specific landscapes that are prone to wildfire or have more wildfire occurring on them to help meet diverse users' needs of incorporating ecological theory with wildfire landscape management. Uh, we are really excited and interested in building a collaborative path that we are using to complete this project as we hope that we can understand diverse users' perspectives while still representing the underlying ecology in a defensible way. So just a little overview, this is one piece of a larger project funded by the Joint Fire Science program we're still in the very early stages as you can see by the yellow star kind of where we're we're into intimately planning that field work component right now and and trying to get our sample design out to our partners um, we have three main objectives for this project where we are first mapping current conditions how things exist on the landscape our second objective will then be also to map desired conditions and that's where we're getting feedback from our partners and then our third will be to map and model where conditions may have departed from the desired condition uh, and working to create this collaborative framework throughout the larger research program. In the end, the point of this is to be able to provide a decision making tool for the use of land management, including fire and fuels within that. So I'm going to just introduce or, and probably just remind many of you just some of the terms and frameworks so that we are all on the same page as I use a lot of acronyms and um, vocabulary. So we're going to talk about ecological sites, ecological site descriptions, state and transition models, and then finally ecological site groups. 
So an ecological site um, are areas on the landscape that share si similar physiographic climate and soil, as well as hydrologic features. They also have similar plant communities and are described in what are known as ecological site descriptions or ESDs, um, which are descriptive reports that anyone can look up for a specific area. Uh, they're found on the internet database known as edit and include the information about the ecological site as well as site interpretations, um, which include a state and transition model for most of these ESDs, uh, which we'll be kind of discussing next. But the state and transition model is something that we're really focused on um, in this broader framework. So a state and transition model describes the changes in plant communities that are associated with an ecological site. These are due to transitions or drivers of change. These drivers of change can be due to natural forces or um, anthropogenic. These, uh, this is an STM as an example from the Hornada Experimental Range in New Mexico, where we have, um, here we have a reference state um, where, and then within that reference state known as the shrub savanna state, there can also be communities. And these plant communities, they really don't require a lot of energy to shift back and forth and can often be found as a result of natural successional change. But when a state experiences a large enough change or a large enough amount of energy input into the system, then we can have a transition into what is known as an alternative state. And these alternative states, um, are, you know, these transitions have uh, a direction of change into the alternative state and are um, often identified as drivers of change. These transitions can are commonly known as things such as overgrazing or drought, recreational use, soil erosion, woody encroachment, as well as fire. Now, when we've been working in these ESDs and these STMs for this particular area, we found that the fire transitions are often fairly vague and underdescribed, which we see as an opportunity to help bring together fire and fuels management with the rest of the management goals that commonly use these STMs and ESDs. And so we are utilizing ecological site groups to help understand um, specifically wildfire trends and management goals, as well as making this tool scalable and transportable across management priorities. ESDs um, and the, their reports describing these uh, forest land soils and vegetations are organized by major land resource areas or MLRAs from the NRCS. And when we looked over our study area, which is the upper Colorado plateau, um, we found that there were over you know, 800 ecological sites, which tend to become difficult for fine, um, large scale management based on the fine scale limitations that um, ESDs provide. And so uh, Travis Nauman and his collaborators worked to condense these ecological sites based on similar characteristics into just 35 ecological site groups, and then was able to map and scale that up across the Colorado Plateau. We're hoping that this might be able to address some of the limitations of having too fine of scale ESDs to make them more generalizable for management. So in a broad overview of the process, this is, you know, very broad, uh, we were, a, or Travis was able to model the soil geomorphic units, um, as well as identify climate zones and combining those two, um, we're able to develop these ecological site groups. So they each have a climate component and a soil geomorphic unit component. This is definitely not showing the vast statistical robustness that these groups were founded in, but just a general idea of how these were made um, and then went on to map these groups, groups of, um, across the Colorado River Basin above Lake Mead. So that brings us to our research goals where um, we are creating generalized state and transition models um, and mapping those current conditions and then mapping the departure from those current conditions or desired states, excuse me. And so to do that, because we're looking to incorporate more robust fire and fuels information into these STMs, we asked the question of whether there were any particular ESGs of those 35 um, that were more fire prone. And we found that there were two ESGs that account for nearly half of the area burned from the monitoring trends and burn severity data in 1984 to 2020. And those two ESGs were the semi-arid warm, which is that climate component. Um, so semi-arid warm, sandy and loamy uplands. 
And the other one is a semi-arid warm shallow and deep rocky uplands. And these two ESGs have large components associated with pinyon and juniper woodlands. So if we remember, we have ESDs, um, they each have an STM to describe the ecological dynamics and, and the ecological potential at these, at these sites. Um, these sites were too numerous or for effective landscape management and lacking that kind of um, really specific fire descriptions. And so uh, to address those challenges, we're creating this framework to develop and document data-driven STMs at the ecological site group level. And so to do that, we're leveraging the national monitoring data sets to provide all of that um, vegetation and soil data into um, mapping these ESGs into generalized state and transition models. So we have multiple lines of evidence to support the creation of these generalized STMs. And one of them is by using statistical clustering of, the, of this monitoring data um, to create new ESG states for an ESG STM. Uh, here is an example of kind of the simple output of a fuzzy clustering for um, the sandy loamy, the semi-arid warm sandy and loamy uplands uh, ESG. And because of that fuzzy clustering, we were able to identify um, what we considered four cluster states or clusters that could then be described as potential states. Um, first, the numbers associated with those uh, four states that you see, they have no hierarchical meaning. They're just a category that's a way to organize the data in R. Um, so with that though, we reviewed the data for the vegetation um, such as presence and cover and soils information within each of these fuzzy clusters. And we have now described these as states, as a shrub state, an open woodland state, a grassland state, and an invaded state. And I'd like to point out, since we're at a grassland meeting, that we do have a grassland state at this ESG, but it's also incorporated with these other states as well. These are a few of our monitoring plot photos um, for this ESG. So this represents all four of those um, cluster states. Uh, this is just to help everyone visualize the kinds of landscapes that we're talking about for this Sandy Lomi Uplands ESG. Remember, this is one of two of the ESGs that we're working with right now. Um, these are the two that account for almost half of the fire area that's happened. Um, the other ESG, the shallow and deep rock uplands uh, has a higher variety of woodlands and pinyon juniper presence in addition to shrubland and grassland states. There's actually seven clusters in that ESG. And it's also important to note that these are very specific to the soil geomorphic units um, and the climate zone that the ESG is in. So this is a semi-arid saline standard soils with a mean annual precip of nine in summer highs ranging 77 to 91 degrees Fahrenheit and winter lows from zero to 18 degrees Fahrenheit for this semi-arid warm sandy and low uplands ESG. So what we then did was take all of those clusters and use random forest mapping to map the current conditions um, of these four states across the upper Colorado River Basin. Um, and we uh, are now, um, this is a very preliminary current conditions map. Uh, we will be confirming with new, new plots this summer. This field campaign that we're gonna be using this summer is to introduce and incorporate more specifically fuels metrics, woody and fine fuel loads, as well as carbon information in addition to the AIM core methods. And so now that we have preliminary maps, we'll go and work to confirm that that mapping is um, acceptable. Uh, as far as accuracy goes. And so now that we have kind of this framework to um, develop the states, we also need to take the next step in developing what those transitions are gonna be to really fully develop a generalized STM, which we're really relying heavily on our collaborative science framework that we've developed. So we have a research team that is um, amazing and full of USGS, Forest Service, NRCS and Utah State University scientists. We are also working with a steering committee with folks from Utah and Colorado BLM, as well as the Forest Service and NRCS. And they help guide 
the goals and our outreach for our workshops that we're having and also guiding that resulting tool development. We really uh, are heavily relying on them to help us not just support our research and reach our target audience, but also to help us as researchers keep our perspective in line with the management priorities across these agencies. And so we've finished um, the first of workshop in our um, whole project uh, timeline where we are working on mapping current conditions. We uh, met with fire and fuels and natural resource managers. Uh, we did those earlier um, in February and just recently at a virtual one. We had folks from several agencies and institutions and tribes to be able to come with this varied experience to give us information and feedback on um, how we're utilizing ESGs to develop an STM. Uh, we showed them and gave them much more detailed information about each of these ESG and that statistical clustering framework. And we had them in small groups develop a generalized STM for each of these two ESGs. And then the second day of the workshop was to provide feedback to inform our data processing and, and field work collection protocol, asking them questions like what data are we missing or what do we need to add more of? Um, and then they have really helped us plan um, our sampling protocols, what we need to be doing to be able to increase the um, descriptions of fire and fuels management to make these generalized STMs um, applicable across management priorities. The other portion um, you know, that we really relied heavily on them is to identify these transition drivers for the STM. So while the monitoring plots gives us the states, we are kind of lacking some data resources for identifying the transition drivers. And so we um, had them draw their own transition drivers, but then we also as a research team went through all of those 800 plus ESD STMs um, and just tabulated what transition drivers were being identified identified um, in those ESDs that connect or correlate to the ESG of question. So this is our tabulated table for the Sandy Loney ESG. And the most frequent um, transition driver was veg invasion. So most likely cheatgrass or other herbaceous invasive species. But I want to highlight the idea here that we do have quite a bit of fire happening within this ESG as a transition driver, but there's not really a framework or, um, you know, vocabulary that we can rely on and being very specific on how fire is interacting as a transition driver. Um, and this is seen at, with both of the ESGs. Again, those fire drivers are somewhat vague and underdescribed. So what we've done is combine all of that workshop feedback and that ESD STM tabulations in addition to the monitoring plot. And we have developed our own preliminary ESG STM. And as of right now, this is where it sits, but what we are waiting for and is excited is because this is still lacking um, that fire and fuel metrics for management decisions is that we will be updating this um, as we support, get that new data from this summer field collection as well as potentially other uh, field collection um, campaigns that we do on in the future. And so this um, is an ESG STM that represents our semi-arid, warm, sandy, and loamy uplands. And we'll be creating one again for that um, deep or shallow and deep rocky um, uplands as well. And uh, with that, I just want to thank you all for being here and being present for this virtual uh, webinar and, and a special thanks to our interagency and institution collaborative partners on this. Um, and I'm excited to hear your questions when we open up for the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Um, we encourage folks to keep putting their questions into the chat. We'll get to those after Scott's presentation. Scott, feel free to start sharing your screen and begin when you're ready. Thanks everybody for, for joining the webinar, as Tara said. Um, I'm really interested in the conversation, not a little bit in a few minutes. Um, really just going to give a little brief overview of Pinion J's and some of the work that we're doing within the Pinion J working group and this big collaborative that we've built. And I think some of the stuff I'm going to talk about will kind of lead right into like what Tara um, set up in terms of ecological site descriptions and 
have, and how that relates to J's and habitat use. So how we're, I got lots of questions after seeing that presentation of how we could use some of this stuff from a J and PJ perspective. So um, looking forward to that. But in the short term, I'm going to just kind of give an overview of J's of what we've been doing and um, kind of kind of where we're going with some of this stuff. So we got into J's, I don't know, about six years ago, we realized trends were pretty terrible. Um, we started the Pinion J Working Group just over six years ago. and um, and here's why. So, you know, the trends were pretty terrible, almost 3% per year, thought to be about 84% loss overall. So new analyses suggest maybe not quite so bad, but still pretty, pretty um, significant declines across the range of the species, which is much of the West. So we started the working group. I think there were seven of us on the first call. Now there's a lot of people on the working group. This thing has evolved and grown. We have a steering committee um, that helps make decisions about what we're doing and where we're going. It's not, um, you know, I just coordinate this this whole partnership. We have co-chairs now with BLM and Colorado Parks and Wildlife. But about three years ago, we released a conservation strategy, which was really the, you know, we just kind of needed to organize everything we knew about Jays at the time and identify the knowns and unknowns, sort of identify research and information needs. We didn't really prioritize them. I think maybe we need to do that now. Um, and some recommended conservation actions of like, there's some things that we can do on the ground that may be good for Jays. I and mean, one of the key things at this point, you know, three years ago was um, to get folks talking about Jays, get it on the radar, been largely under the radar for, for all this time. And like, we need to start paying attention to, to pinion Jays. So at this point, there's now at least three different states that have fairly formal organized working groups as well, which is awesome. There's a lot of overlap between um, the, the national working group, whatever you want to call it, and the state groups. Lots of folks are interested. Um, yeah, and just over a year ago, we got a petition for a listing um, pinion jays under the Endangered Species Act. So one of the things that we've we've worked on a lot of backstory, but um, a couple of months ago, we finalized a standardized survey protocol for we call it the Landscape Applications Protocol kind of big scale monitoring, and I'll explain some additional stuff here, but the purpose of this, it's kind of just coordinated bird monitoring. Jays are a really hard bird to work on because they have huge home ranges and use lots of different woodland structures across the landscape and, and habitats that are not woodland at all. Um, and so the kind of information you collect in the field is really important to understanding, you know, what those detections meant. Um, and so this protocol, which people have started to, to field tested this year, well, can help answer specific questions, both within your state or a bigger geography or BLM district, or whatever, um, but also, you know, potentially range-wide at a bigger scale. So looking at trends, increasing our knowledge of species distribution models, ultimately you need to find birds to be able to ask and nesting colonies to be able to ask additional questions about breeding season activity. And there's a good standardized way to get there. And then if multiple partners are collecting the data the same way, we have this incredibly powerful data set, which um, we do, if you're not familiar with the Avian Knowledge Network, basically kind of like an online database, secure place where you can put all your bird data um, and have it all be in one place for lots of different partners. So when we want to do some additional analyses across lots of partners, we can have it all in one place mostly and get you know uh, one big download of all the information that was available and it's all collected the same way, which can be incredibly powerful. So one of the conversations we're gonna start having soon to you know, amplify the value of what we're doing from J surveys is talking about um, doing this range wide across most or all of the states across the range of the Pinion J, which is a huge effort. Take a big facilitated um, meeting to figure out what those specific questions are and talk about how we could pull that off. But if we did that well, and we really, we thought through that, we could have an incredibly powerful data set, um, not just on J occurrence, but there's a lot of stuff we could, we could ask by doing this. And so of course we finished that protocol and then realized, you know, we already knew we needed something more than the big project, big area surveys. Um, you know, a lot of the questions that I get are like, we're doing some management, we don't know about impacts to pinion jays. We'll be doing a smaller treatment. We're talking a couple hundred acres, maybe a couple thousand acres. It's kind of hard to understand that. And so we need a different protocol to kind of ask that question. And I'll get these questions from BLM and the Forest Service. 
Um, some state agencies are doing work as management as well. We're calling it, you know, don't know exactly what that's going to look like. I know uh, Great Basin Bird Observatory and, and Arizona Game of Fish are, are developing something now. Um, uh, we will likely be able to adopt that, hopefully, from a working group perspective and be able to roll that out. No, re no reason to recreate the wheel. Um, but this is the kind of stuff, and it gets, it's not just like going out and seeing birds, but it's behaviors, what they're doing, where they're spending their time. Uh, to kind of understand, you know, what, what treatment impacts are. So one of the things that we're almost done is updating and expanding Opinion J um, model, predictive model, essentially. We have one that's breeding bird survey based only and just within the sagebrush ecosystem. This is range-wide for the bird, includes IMBCR data, stop-level BBS, lots of other point-level data within different states and heritage data. And so this is occurrence, it's not abundance or density. Um, the deeper the blue, the higher probability of occurrence of jays in the area. Um, and this is a model for breeding season, which can be mid-February. They start courting and all to uh, mid-May, but IMBCR and BBS are typically sort of after the breeding season. So this is sort of that breeding season, early summer period. Um, model, which their jays after the breeding season are still within their home range, home ranges. Um, by and large, are still within their home ranges, so um, likely makes it, makes a lot of sense. So we've got a whole lot of partners that have contributed data that have been involved with this process from the beginning and through all the iterations of this thing that we've gone through, um, identifying landforms and all those covariates to help inform this thing. It's it's gone through lots of iterations and lots of state review. To kind of get it to where it is hopefully it'll be done fairly soon and we're sort of working on those caveats of how we want it to be used and what we make available to folks when it's published um, not to make a management decision per se but use it as a tool to if you're interested in jays you have a likely high likelihood of jays in the area maybe we should do some surveys uh, and we'll have different protocols to be able to answer some of those um, depending on what the question is so but this will likely be very helpful tool for, for agencies um, doing any kind of work in PJ. So some of the other stuff that we've been working on, work, some outreach documents, we're a bunch of biologists, we're a bunch of nerds, um, the bird nerds, but we, we have a, um, a two-pager, kind of like a, just a little who the working group, Opinion J work group is, kind of audiences for really anybody interested in Js. We will eventually get that done. Um, too many Too many things on the plate, but we'll get there. Um, and then number two here is this document that was released uh, maybe a couple, two weeks ago now, um, the Intermountain West Joint Venture, and Mariah McIntosh, who I saw was on, on the call here um, with BLM and myself, developed this document, um, really kind of talked to, talk about PJ and climate resilience. It's a very kind of general, talks about some of the specific PJ research that's going on. I feel like we're going to connect a whole lot more dots on this webinar with the folks that are on here. Um, it's just going to be really cool. There's Jays are sort of mentioned just a little bit in this, but the idea is communication, uh, tech transfer from you know the, the scientists to the folks on the ground, something simple that they can use to make help inform management decisions and provide information to them. And ideally, it's sort of this mechanism through the IWJV and their support from the management board. Um, will be really helpful down the road for whether it's more J-specific stuff or more PJ-specific stuff. We have a way to blast information um, to connect that, fill that gap from the scientists to the practitioners. So some of the fun stuff that we're working on, which is going to get into PJ management and the ecotone and um, sort of the, the, the next conversation. We've got a couple different projects going on. I realize this is a big crazy map. The All the blue that you see, the deeper blue is the sagebrush um, bird model that Fish and Wildlife Services sagebrush ecosystem team develops. So deeper the blue, higher likely probability of occurrence of sage grouse and the three sagebrush obligate songbirds. This purple layer here is the, the BBS based J model that we're working on updating. This is still pretty good, but the the visual image here is we've got two big orange circles here. They're different PhD students working um, with Dr. Clark Rushing, who was at Utah State. Of course, as soon as we got this started, he moved to University of Georgia. So both students are at UGA. But looking at J movements, habitat use, how they're using these managed landscapes, how are they using these ecotones, 
what's good, what, what, what may not be good, what are they avoiding altogether, um, and to start to piece that together to understand changes in the landscape, whether that's management, climate change impacts, et cetera, on pinion jays. And there's also another PhD student working sort of in that black circle, sort of in the middle um, with Dave Dahlgren at Utah State, doing the same work, just a different geography. We're all um, coordinating and collaborating on all of this stuff together. And so one of the ways we need to get at J use and habitat use and spatial data is by putting GPS tags on Js. Um, so after lots of uh, challenges last year for a variety of reasons, it's a whole other story. Um, kind of right, our student here on the left finally caught some Js and got some Argos tags out. Um, well, well, I guess over um, over a month ago now, starting to get some spatial data. Um, we can log in the computer and kind of see where the bird is, which has been pretty fascinating. She's gotten tags out and. Um, Colorado, or Utah, New Mexico, I think in four four different locations now. So just to kind of give you an idea, this isn't, we haven't vetted all these points for accuracy. Some of them may not be quite right, but this is a spot sort of nearish Price, Utah, not too far from Tara, couple, an hour and a half or so, two hours north of there. Um, all of these points are about two hours apart and the sort of the spatial extent from east to west is about 14 miles. Hence the challenge of pinion jays. There are some other points that are kind of obviously wrong on here, but if you kind of focus on the middle part of this map, they all seem pretty reasonable about where the birds, these, these are two different individuals or where they were. And this is about over a course of a week. Um, so a lot more of this kind of information, lots of observations of jays through surveys, just like sitting and watching birds as long as possible to get an idea of what they're doing looking at the treatment history, looking at the woodland condition, um, is gonna be really informative. So the last, sort of the last slide here, um, all of this kind of builds into this idea of that, you know, we came from this, from like a Jay perspective and um, some things that we know are really important for Jays and we can have an impact on Jays, like nesting colonies, but they're using the entire landscape. They're using, you know, watersheds practically. Um, and, and needing a bigger picture approach. So the two photos on here are from the same spot. One's looking west, the left photo. One's looking east, more or less, the right photo. And there's a jay nesting colony near this site in Nevada. They're using all of this. The left photo, they're using that low density that ecotone with sagebrush up there. I don't have a good picture of grasslands. I need to come down and, and see some of the ecotone down there. Um, they use that for foraging and caching. The right photo, you know, the more open, mature woodlands with the grass and, and shrub component they nest in. Lots of foraging in there, especially when there's mast, and they roost in more dense woodlands up on the hillside. So they use all of this. So thinking about this from both the sage perspective, but also down to the grassland perspective, um, you know, we need to figure out what jays need, what are most important things to them, and how they're using this, this landscape and these ecotones, because you can see the miles out in the sagebrush foraging. Um, they make big movements over non-PJ, non-woodland habitat. But also lots of management is occurring, which may or may be good for jays, may not be good for jays. And how can we develop a big picture approach? It's not just about managing fuels, managing something for big game, managing this for forestry. We can't manage for jays per se necessarily. We need to think about it from an ecological function standpoint for pinion juniper woodlands. Um, and that includes the ecotone in the grasslands, and that includes the ecotone in the sagebrush. I won't talk about sagebrush, but just the grasslands. But there's lots of management objectives that we can meet at the same time, by and large, big picture. And think seeing Tyra's talk and thinking about that a little bit, we need to digest a little bit more of kind of how we can overlap what what um, the USGS is working on, some of the ideas that we have some from like the J perspective and um, they're all overlap, very much so. And how can we marry these two to, to build this kind of approach and where it would work most effectively? So that's all I've got. Hopefully we have plenty of time for, for discussion. Um, I can always put my email in the chat if y'all want that too. Thank you, Scott. That would, so great. Maybe I'll ask the, the folks on the panel who we haven't met yet, so Steve, uh, Edwin, John, and Valerie to just briefly just say hi, introduce yourselves, and, and maybe your affiliation. Um, so maybe starting with you, Steve. 
Yeah, hi, it's Steve Cassidy. I'm with the Arizona Game and Fish Department, headquartered in Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, do a, quite a little bit of grassland restoration work up here in northern Arizona. Thank you, Steve. I'll pass it to you, John. Hi, everybody. John Boone, Great Basin Bird Observatory, based in Reno, Nevada. Thank you, John. Valerie? Hi, everyone. Valerie Stein Foster, uh, Wildlife Program Manager for the Kaibab National Forest in Williams, Arizona. Thank you so much, Valerie. And, and Edwin? May still be muted. I don't know if you're trying to say something, Edwin, or uh, or if you're not here, that's fine as well. We can jump back to you. All right, cool. Um, then thank you so much. Thank you for our speakers. Thank you also to the folks who are joining the panel. Um, Carly, did you want to run through the ask one of the questions that we got from the presenters? We had a few there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first one I see looks like was for Tara. And it's what kind of monitoring is needed to use state and transition models you are developing. And it's a two-parter. Um, how resource intensive is this monitoring from a time and money perspective and any tools you suggest for conducting the monitoring? Okay, so at the first part of the question about what data we're collecting for our monitoring. Um, so right now we have, um, used previous monitoring done by um, federal monitoring programs, such as the AIM, which is BLM. Um, and we also have NPS, so National Park Service data, and um, the NRCS, NRI program, um, and also the BLM LMF program. So like just lots of federal monitoring programs. We are attempting to try and see if we can work something out with getting FIA data from the Forest Service because these are PJ Woodlands, you know, going up into Forest uh, Service areas, and so that's what we've used to do all of our um, current conditions mapping thus far. Um, as far as our data that we're going to be collecting um, this upcoming year, we are in close contact with BLM, so we know where they are going for their 2023 AIM monitoring um, sessions. Um, and so we're trying to maximize kind of spatial holes with that. And we, we are sending out teams this summer to um, collect data. We'll be using the AIM core methods. But then we're also going to be including stuff for fire and fuels known, we're going to be doing Brown's transects, which measure the fuel loads for, you know, 100 hour fuel, hour fuels, things like that. And then we're also going to be doing some fine fuel biomass collection as well. Um, it's going to be, uh, I think, so we're using that to confirm our ESGs and confirm the states um, that the ESGs are in, as well as bringing in that fire aspect into the STM. Uh, it's going to be pretty intensive, and um, you know this is all funded on that Joint Fire Science um, funding program. We are not setting up a monitoring program, so we will do this year's data collection. We might do a additional plots next year, depending on what those mapping situations are like, but that's going to be it. And then we can always update our modeling based on new AIM and, and NPS data and FIA data that comes through. So we're doing this kind of short one or two year um, with a very specific sampling design in mind to inform the transitions but then we will rely on continued federal monitoring data um, that's publicly available. I hope I answered both of those sections of questions. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I think so, yeah, that was great, thank you. Um, Ariel, I saw you unmuted, if, you, if there's something else you wanted to add to that. No, I think that's great. Um, I was just gonna move on to the next question here that we had, um, and Tara, you, you mentioned that there are, um, 
those sort of drivers that you're looking at to moving in between those sort of steady states. And I'm wondering if those are sort of coupled with, I, I was trying to interpret the symbols there, um, but with man management recommendations for, I'm thinking from a land manager perspective, who's trying to meet certain goals that one of these steady states will be in, assesses their landscape, uses the monitoring data that y'all have developed to be like, okay, I think I'm, I'm in one of these steady states, I'm moving towards another one what sort of management recommendations are there? And if you could speak a little bit more to, and I think I'd extend it after Tara to, to the rest of the panel, thinking yeah. about some of these management options that they have for moving in between, you know, maybe a, 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 a previous grassland that was, that was encroached by woody plants or, you know, um, trying to bring back uh, a component of pinion juniper after a catastrophic fire or somebody, like, something mm -hmm. like that. So really taking that sort of management perspective to make these, these usable and, be able to move from one state to the other from a management perspective yeah so those icons right those are just our way of i you know usually these esds have these or these stms have these big legends and and um they always have kind of management interpretations with them so we will be including that in our descriptions of the esg stms um things like you know, let's say you're in, um, we have like a pinion open, you know, an open PJ woodland and it experiences a fire and transitions it into um, like an invaded open woodland, right? And so that then becomes, well, what interpretations can we make from that transition that would be management applicable um, as well as things like why we want to increase the robustness in the descriptions of the fire um, is because a lot of, you know, our agency uh, management agencies are using prescribed fire more often, uh, brush management, uh, chaining, all of those kinds of things to kind of tackle these questions about woody encroachment. Is it woody encroachment? Is it just returning back to a steady state from before? Like all these big questions. But if we can identify like just the fact that if you have this state and it can transition into that state, is you know that alternative state a desired condition? Because if it is, then these you know transition drivers are things to be looking for. And that could be things like grazing, removal of grazing, introducing a prescribed fire, you know, so they definitely have a very tightly linked management implication for any of those transitions that we're trying to identify, which is why we need more um, critical information about fuels, because we don't want to have an interpretation of, yeah, prescribed fire would be great for this transition, but not have the data to back that up. <laughs> Thanks, Tara. And um, yeah, if anybody else on the panel wants to speak to managing those management options that we have for transitioning these eco sites from either grassland dominated or pinion juniper dominated um, and what's what's sort of available there and how how we're making decisions about what to use we'd love to open it up there i don't know if this is a dumb question or not but i assume you're getting requests for this kind of information to figure out how to to manage the ecotone or whatever on on specific federal properties as they're developing management plans and trying to figure out like what would be the most likely condition to be supported on each of these sites to like, I mean, it can be pretty fine scale, pretty nuanced management. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. sorry, um, I was gonna add, but you go, yeah, sorry. I'm gonna put myself on mute. I was just going to confirm that, yeah, that's that's exactly it. That's what we're hearing is that, you know, trying to find the, the right technique to maintain the, the sort of state that we're looking for that meets that suite of goals we're managing, um, you know, from a management from a management perspective in these different. Um, yeah, and what what? Yeah. And, and those yes. are for each each person coming as a different management question, I assume. And I assume there's all, everyone's got a different funding source, whether it's the game or fuels or something to make those things happen. Yeah. I'm just thinking, like, you know, if we're trying to get in a different direction, like how can we, you know, are there funds to make that happen? Do we have to tweak, do it under the guise of something else? I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud here. Yeah, maybe um, maybe I could pass that to either Steve or Valerie. Steve, I know that y'all are uh, trying to improve conditions with pronghorn and some of the grasslands around um, 
around Flagstaff, and maybe you could speak a little bit to some of the funding sources that, that are available there and, and how you, what management techniques you're using in, in that area. Yeah, I'll jump in here. Um, I also just saw a question um, popped up is uh, PJ or Opinion J um, enhancement, or I forget the exact, and um, enhancement of grasslands for pronghorn and, and, um, and grass independent species, mutually exclusive. I sure hope not. Um, and I don't, I really don't think so. One of the things that that I think we have to be really careful of is when we're doing grassland restoration work, we really are just doing grassland restoration work and not, not PJ conversion, um, which I know we, you know, I'm probably guilty of it earlier in my career too. We've done a lot of that in the past, you know, increased forage production or browse production, things like that. And, and that's not necessarily um, always bad um, for opinion days, I imagine. But but anyway, we, we do need to, to, to limit what we do for grassland restoration work to grasslands. And <clears throat> the state and transition or the, the ecological site descriptions on the soil surveys and the ecological site descriptions associated with those are very helpful in us doing that. Um, they're, they're not, you know, the final end. And typically this kind of let people know how we do this, or at least I do this, is I'll take a look at these sources of information, soil surveys and, and terrestrial ecosystem surveys and uh, identify what's, you know, and find what's identified as should be grasslands or savannas and then um, utilize that as a first cut. And then I found you definitely got to get your boots on the ground to see if it's really, really what you want to treat. Um, soil surveys are great, but they, you know, most of them are pretty old by now and, and we're done with a lot for, um technology than we have now to identify what is a you know a fairly deep soil and things like that but um anyway and yeah as far as i've not worked too much with going um from a grassland back into uh in pj i'm sure there's there's definitely a need for that in a lot of places um you know we've had a couple of huge fires uh, valerie can tell you the one up on in the uh, North Kaibab district that burned an awful lot of PJ and, and a little more than we like to see at any one time, but little little patch burns here and there like we used to see a lot of were probably just raw for the, for the diversity of critters and stuff. And one thing I'm really looking forward to is is as they look into this, what the needs are for the pinion jays, um, what is it that we as managers need to do to try to enhance, um, you know, make you know, do we need to keep the savannas more healthy? I mean, in this country, there has been a huge, huge die off of pinion trees and a fair number of, of juniper trees in the last four or five years, 10 years, last decade anyway. And kind of need to, you know, obviously it's drought, but what is there anything we could have done to mitigate that, make it, made it so it wasn't quite so bad? Anyways, those are some questions I had, some comments and questions. I'm open for questions from anybody else or comments. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. Um, any thoughts from other folks on the, the panel from if management for pronghorn and pinion jays are mutually exclusive or? I'll, I'll jump in there, Ariel. Um, yeah, so just kind of to tag on to what, what Steve was talking about. Um, you know, we're certainly trying to find a balance, you know, on, on our uh, national forest. Um, we have uh, various models that have been developed for kind of, you know, what pronghorn would be ideally looking for on the landscape. Um, the state has done a, a really, a lot of work collaring and looking at movement of pronghorn and, and other big game species too. So we've got some pretty big landscape scale projects right now going on where we are trying to balance this, the needs of that species as well as jays. So we're doing a lot of surveys for jays too, um, working with Great Basin Bird Observatory and the state on that as well in terms of implementing the landscape protocol and then also testing some of the more project level type um, surveys this year. So we are kind of, um, I guess we're two years into that now. So we're starting to generate some data, fig just figuring out like where are the jays on the landscape? 
how does this overlap with other kind of, you know, some of the big game species and kind of the areas that we're working on so that we can then incorporate the needs of both of those species and the work kind of moving forward. Um, as well, um, Steve mentioned the soils. Um, that is something that when we revised our land and resource management plan a few years ago, um, we relied on those mollusols to really kind of help us characterize kind of where are the areas that we want to do grassland restoration, which would have been historical, uh, you know, historically used by pronghorn and other species that are in those grassland types. However, the areas that we're not as certain about, and I'm really curious about the state and transition modeling in particular, is kind of more in the in the PJ woodland itself. And so kind of what does that look like? Um, in the context of, of some of these other species like pinyon jay that are using those habitats. So that's something I'm super interested in, in learning more about and following up with Tara on as well. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I think I'm hopeful that, you know, we can kind of balance out the needs. And I was also going to kind of mention in terms of funding, one of our projects is a big joint chiefs project. Um, so we're working on with Steve and, and others on kind of implementing that across um, the Kaibab and, and various lands adjacent to the forest. Um, and that is, uh, you know, Scott had alluded to multiple funding streams, different resource areas. So that is a while it's a fuels reduction and a wildlife enhancement project. So we're kind of um, trying to thread the needle kind of between that, that the, the fuels and fire side of the house with also the wildlife habitat enhancement side of the house on that project and working uh, collaboratively with our other um, resource areas and our other program managers um, that are not necessarily wildlife. So those conversations that happen in that interdisciplinary team context are, are really valuable and important as we're starting to think about how to, how to implement these projects. Thanks, Valerie. Um, we have a few other questions, but I wanted to leave a, a moment to see if anybody else from the from the panel had a had a response or anything to, to add. I actually have a question, just a quick question um, for Tara. I might have missed it. Are you accounting for the mycorrhizal community with with the state and transition models too, in terms of soils, and I, I might have missed that when you were going over the the inputs. Not yeah. So um, as much as I think Sasha Reed, who's on our research team, would love to. Um, so right now, like uh, we're mostly using like just pretty basic soils information, geomorphic information, and then plant communities, right? So. Um, there's uh, because it's a lot of remote sensing based products that we're using, you know, th th those things aren't really mapped out like that. Um, and so, no, we that is not part of the decision tree for our random forest mapping or our clustering. OK, fair enough. Thanks. I was just curious. Yeah. I know I have more questions about pronghorn, <laughs> and I will follow up with some folks about and sort of how if, if they're using the ecotone, or if it's like real grass, or they're avoiding trees altogether. I don't know. Um, and I guess my other question is, when you guys are restoring grassland, you know, what is what does that edge look like at the edge of a of a, a project area, treatment area? Is that a hard edge with PJ? That's denser woodlands that are left, or are you largely treating just like real? like smaller, younger expansion or younger trees out in the grass. I guess I, I need a field trip. I need to see a little bit more of this, get a better handle on this. So I think we have little, one coming up here in the future, Scott, if you want to come let along. Know. Let me know. <laughs> let me know. Yeah, not the upfront jump in. Yeah, we everything you said there, we have it all. There's hard edges, there's, there's transitions from from small trees to large trees, uh, you know, density increases or decreases and things like that. So, and as far as the pronghorn, you know, we, we joke here and we, we've created a woodland variant of the pronghorn because you'll see them in the Ponderosa pine. Um, typically my experience, and I'm not a biologist, I was a habit or I'm a range manager specialist by training. And, um, but what I've seen is that they typically, there's got to be some open grassland somewhere within a short distance, you know, with a quarter mile or so 
for them to be into those trees very much. And they don't like, they definitely don't like real dense trees. And when you get into the real, real dense PJ, you, you rarely find them in there, but you do find them in, in some pretty, you know, some savanna types where the trees are, you know, maybe even 15, 20 trees per acre or, or, or possibly more. But um, so it's not that they won't use the woodlands, um, especially savanna, more leaning more towards savanna. It's just if they don't have some open grasslands nearby, they, they, they won't be there. Thank you. That makes sense. Thanks, y'all. We are a little bit over one, um, but we've got a couple other questions here that we can we can go through if folks can stay with us for a little bit longer. Um, we had a few questions here from Tim. Uh, Tim, one of the first questions that that you asked was about tribal engagement uh, in the the studies that Tara was was running. Um, and yeah, I'd love to sort of broaden that question out to think about, yeah, I think it's a great question for you, Tara, because you're talking about that collaborative approach, but also for um, the rest of the panel who's working in these ecotones, if you could speak a little bit to tribal engagement in these projects. Yeah, so, I mean, I am, haven't been working with the feds for very long, just a few years now. Um, and it was something that we identified as being really critical, especially considering how much of our ESG and um, you know study area is across tribal lands and in and the high priority that we know that pinyon juniper woodlands are culturally um, as well as ecologically in these systems and so um, it was a big learning process for me as a federal employee rather than like a university uh, person as far as engagement and reaching out. Um, and, you know, we were very cognizant of not just trying to ask the same people that we know other people have asked because of, um, you know, the high burden that that can be on, but we were able to get um, a couple of folks for our virtual workshop from the Southern Utes and the Navajo Nations um, in resource management that were present, and it was incredible to hear their perspectives and how different decisions are made, you know, very similarly within the U.S. federal government as well, but also very different. And so um, I'd highly recommend trying to make sure that that um, pathway and those relationships are developed and established with all of our science that is, is happening. Um, I've been very grateful for it, and we've gotten a lot of really great insight from them. I don't know if there was like a specific, like how we went about making connections or not, but uh, yeah, I mean, we, we worked with our tribal li liaison folks um, within the USGS, as well as um, Sasha Reed has been doing work with the Mesa Verde area and had some contacts out there that we just kind of started asking around and sharing our invitation, right? We, we crafted an invitation letter to be able to be sent out um, broadly. Thanks, Tara. Yeah, Tim, if you had any other specific questions or questions for the other members of the panel, feel free to unmute and go for it. Okay, um, Tara, thank you. Your answer is very helpful. Um, I work with the, uh, have been a member of the New Mexico Prescribed Fire Council for a number of years, and we have some intertribal group membership with that. Um, there are some other groups up in your area that uh, may also be willing or interested in participating. Sometimes a letter is a difficult way to approach um, culturally, but uh, I'll see what I can find out on that side. And for Scott, um, you definitely are crossing into in your studies on the Pino <laughs> Juniper, a lot of tribal lands in Northern New Mexico and Colorado and uh, Arizona and Utah. So um, I, I'm glad to see this group starting up and uh, hopefully I can maybe open some doors or at least give some pointers uh, for people getting some more involvement and perhaps training some more people because um, that's a big factor in the uh, land management and uh, resource management for um, all the peoples involved in the area. Yeah, and I'll, I'll kind of jump in on that on the, the training piece too. Um, 
we have been working with Navajo Technical University and Northern Arizona University and Great Basin Bird Observatory to start to um, train some of the Navajo students uh, to, to do some of the citizen science um, uh, based surveys that have been developed for Pinion J as well. Um, uh, Hopi is also interested and so we're starting to work with them and have conversations about weaving them into some of the landscape scale uh, protocols for next year. So we're, we're having those conversations. Um, and then the other piece I'll just mention is our tribal liaisons are doing, um, they just had some meetings with some of the tribes recently to talk about some of our um, grassland restoration work on the Kaibab and just kind of where there might be opportunities to, to do code stewardship with them. So they're actually kind of coming out, walking the ground with us and we're having those conversations as well. So we're pretty excited about it and where it might go. We also have a program um, in Northern Arizona called Wood for Life. And so that's another opportunity to work with the tribes where some of that material that's coming out of the mastic, uh, the, the removal with the juniper can be then um, uh, uh, moved and moved over to the tribes. And so that's something else that we're talking about as well with them. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Valerie. And uh, mastication is not a dirty word. <laughs> Thank you for those questions um, and for the insightful answers. We appreciate it. Um, Tim also had a question about, uh, you also had a question about seeing gra grassland conversion types, seeing, asking if we're seeing upper Sonoran grassland conversing to great basin grassland types. Um, and I'm wondering if that's sort of related also to the movement of cheatgrass. Um, that question was related to the movement of cheatgrass to helping that conversion type. But um, yeah, anybody who's been working in those in these grasslands um, on the panel or or beyond the panel as well, if you're seeing that sort of conversion, would love to hear from that. Yeah, not necessarily just uh, Sonora to Great Basin, but Great Basin into Sonora um, as well, and then further further south, buffalo grass, of course, is an issue in Arizona but um, it's altitude limited pretty well. So one of the things I've um, observed um, here in, in my region is we are actually seeing red roam showing up. Um, it's like 6,000 feet, which you know my training was it stayed below 4,000, 4,500 feet. So yeah, there's there's definitely whether the plants morphing or uh, you know climate warming is creating this. Um, I'm not sure, but it's coming. I can chime in on the next one. Another one from from Tim. Um, which is fabulous. And it's, have you identified the last stand replacing fire events across the area? I think that, that could probably be open to the group. I'm not sure when that came in during the discussion. So something with our work, um, you know, it's, we're really trying to focus on getting sampling done from various like fire histories. Right, so that we can understand is it natural succession that's happening or is it actual state transition, right, going from one state to another, um, because natural succession will happen um, within a state as those community phases happen. We only have fire data up through 2021. And so um, we are missing 2022 fire data. Also, you know, uh, as far as like GIS remote sensing fire data the most accurate polygons and like fire boundaries for the monitoring trends and burn severity, but they have a size cutoff for what, uh, what they do for their um, database. And so we've tried to kind of, kind of rig up our own where we get the point data for a lot of those smaller fires and then create buffer zones around there just so that we can try to address some of those smaller fires because we don't want to undercharacterized fire history just because we're ignoring small fires. So that's kind of what we're doing, but we are missing last year. We don't, we don't have last year's data. Okay, Tara, uh, this is Tim again. 
Um, actually, that question to be answered would have to come from dendrochronology because the stand cycle sequence that I'm aware of for pinyon juniper is a six to 800 year uh, stand replacement fire interval with the gradual encroachment change on that. So without the dendrochronology, chronology, it's, it's tough. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, we're definitely not um, identifying um, specific like same geographic regions that have burned more than once, right? As far as um, because those fire intervals have been longer, but those fire intervals are shortening and we're seeing um, from our, the data that we're looking at is more and more fire happening during, you know, like the decadal um, drought that we've had and the warming temperatures. And so we are talking about generally over large landscapes, not at very specific eco sites, right? And so um, generally we're seeing more fire happening in PJ woodlands, but those are not being captured within the forest service and other folks um, uh, modeling that they have because they're very good at modeling um, forest fires and these woodlands are kind of in those transition zones. And so, um, yeah, we're just, um, we're doing the best that we can with the data that we have to try and, you know, make the tool best we can. Yeah, that is what we're looking at. The Forest Service uh, pretty selectively stopped making forest when it got to PJ <laughs> across the West. Uh, and thank you, Michelle, that uh, list I'm familiar with, and it is excellent. Thank you so much, everyone. We appreciate your time. Um, we will be sure to send out a, 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 a webinar summary with all the resources that people sent in the chat um, and make that available to folks who are both here and who weren't present. Um, we'll also send out some of the references to previous webinars and webinar summaries that are in the Grassland Community of Practice public folder. Um, we'll make sure that folks have access to that as well. Um, is there anything else that I'm missing in closing here, Carly? I don't think so. Just wanna thank everyone for jumping on today. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you to all our speakers. Have a good day.